pain, trauma, depression, struggle, fear. For any veteran, these feelings can rock them to their core. But when those boundaries are met, what do you do? Do you cave in? Seek the bottle? Let it all end? Or do you fight? Do you seek help? Do you rise above your circumstances? For one man who's been through some of the worst life can offer, hope and healing are found in the paws of a dear friend. This is his story. My name is Toby Yarbrough. I was a sergeant in the United States Army and I was born in May of 1965. I'm the youngest of three siblings. I was actually, I was born in California uh, at age of seven. Uh, we moved from California to Arkansas. In between, uh, to the, the final move, my, uh, my father and I, we went to Arkansas on vacation and he was getting a lot of stuff prepped for the major move for the whole family in 1972. From there, we lived in Hope, Arkansas. Most of my early childhood, you know, was living in Hope while we were getting the, the main property you know, all set up to, to live out there. Once we, we moved out there, uh, we had horses and regular farm. You know, we had chicken houses and we had pigs and we had horses and had cattle. And during harvest time, everybody was, is close knit. Everybody help each other out. Uh, when it's time to cut hay, everybody comes over and they will cut, you know, one neighbor's one day and then the next day, you know, they'll come over to, to cut somebody else's. So it's a, World close knit family, and uh, so everybody knew everybody. Uh, if you need help, I had to just pick up the phone because it was, back then it was a party line, so you had at least about six or seven families on one phone line. Toby's desire to serve his nation started at an early age in Arkansas. The events that followed would go on to set the course of his life. I decided to join the military. Uh, in my early teens is because my neighbor was Paul Clips. He was a World War II pilot, Air Force, a Air Force pilot. One Sunday after church, he asked my parents to go flying with him. And my dad said, I'm, well, we're busy this weekend, how you got plans, but the following weekend, you know, uh, we went flying. And pretty much every Sunday after church, it was a routine. I fell in love flying airplanes. He showed me the ropes and mowed me on what I need to study to become a pilot for the Air Force. So I knew how to fly airplanes before I knew how to drive. So I took my physical my, uh, for the Air Force, fell my flight physical, and so my dream was shot. But luckily for Toby, this wasn't the end of his dream. His cousin suggested that the two of them join the Army on the buddy system. So I checked out the Army and uh, they had a program as a mechanical engineer. I'm like, hmm, well, I work stuff on the farm with my hands and uh, farm equipment. I'm like, oh, I'll give that a, 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 a try. Grenada was Toby's first assignment after joining the Army. The young man was nervous to be deployed so far from home, but as he soon found out upon arrival, the fighting was finished. Well, I, at the beginning, I, I was like, I knew that when I joined the military that there was a lot of action going on in Grenada, because that was in the early 80s. So when I hit Grenada in 83, it was pretty much the tail end of the conflict, and it was like, okay, I'm gonna hit a combat zone, I'm 18 years old, uh, a lot of the uh, senior NCOs, like, uh, I'm wanting to just clear off and get feedback off of them because they've been in combat. They've been, they've been in Vietnam, you know, and Korea and everything else. So I want to listen to them from what be, you know, in a combat. But once I got there, it was a clean up job. Everything was done and over with. It was the stuff that we tore up, we fixed and we fixed it better than you know, what it was. 
during operations Desert Storm and Desert Shield. Toby and his crew were in charge of maintaining a variety of equipment. From M16s to Humvees and even tanks, every mechanical item used had to be functional and ready for combat. On a quiet day, these tasks took time. But sometimes, they became even tougher with the threat of airstrikes and falling debris at any given moment. Being in a desert shell, desert storm, uh, in a combat zone, it was, a, it was like night and day from actually working, living in the barracks and everything else. You have a lot of missions going on, but prior we was getting everything prepped for the war. And that was doing you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. We were doing a lot of drills. We were making sure our equipment was up and running, make sure everything was was ready to go. And we prepped and we prepped and we trained. And so when it finally hit, we was ready. September 11th, 2001. A day that will forever be remembered by every American in this lifetime. Everyone was affected after that tragic day in some way, even Toby. I can still remember to this day, I was at the motor pool, I was working on a D7 dozer, and one of the guys was coming out of the, uh, out of the bay and say, uh, there's a plane that hit the tower. So everybody stopped what we was doing, we went in, and we got a phone call and said, that everybody said, go to the battalion. And everybody was going, went to the, to the battalion, went into the, the uh, classroom, and we was watching. By that time, we seen the second uh, plane hit the tower. So we was like, you know, why in the world somebody ain't stopping this? You know, and the next thing we knew, you know, somebody, another plane hit the Pentagon. You know, and then somebody, you know, these people would save their lives, you know, and stopped the hijackers, you know, and the other plane went down in the open field. I, uh, you know, I was thinking back, I like, I got called, I said, I gotta make phone calls because my brother-in-law at the time, uh, he worked in the Pentagon. And it was just lucky that he was, you know, where the plane hit, it was on the opposite end of where he worked at but I didn't know. But also, he was not there at the time, too. He was at, uh, he was at Fort Sill, Oklahoma on the day that it happened. But there are a lot of family members, and it's like their lives change because within 15, between 15 and 45 days, their, you know, their loved ones, they left. They got deployed. They went overseas. And some of these are very young kids that never seen combat, and they're like, okay, what we want to do? I tell, I tell them, you know what? You do what you're told. I already got, I said, combat stripes. I already have combat patches. I've been in combat. I said, you listen to the senior people. They're going to save your butt while you're over there. And luckily enough, everybody that was in my, was in my last unit, they came home. So that was, you know, a, a blessing on me that I knew that everybody came home. During Operation Enduring Freedom, Toby was in charge of a contact team attached to the Air Force and the Marines. First one's in, first one's out. If something broke down, they fixed it. The constant rotation of work was stressful, but there were still moments of relief. You turn, turn around and tell a private say, uh, you uh, go go uh, to the two room and or hey go over there see that sergeant there. Uh, he's in the contact team. He got uh, tell him that you need a can of AIR and like AIR they don't know what you know it's like so they walk over and say uh, hey hey sergeant or specialist or you know uh, sergeant so and so came over and said need a can of AIR. Oh well we tell we knew what was going on so I uh, I'm sorry I'm fresh out. Uh, go see so and so in the two room, you know, parts room. Then they might have some, you know, can in there. And and then he'll turn around and say, No, go over there and see go over there Bravo Company and see if they have it. So we have this private all day. He's going to different motor pool, trying to find a can of AIR, which is nut but it says air. 
Uh, but we had one guy who was really smart because he turned around and said, yeah, I need a can of AIR. He walked up towards me and I said, he, at, he said, Sergeant Yarber said, I need a can of AIR. And I was like, I, I don't have any on my truck. Go in there and see a uh, special Goldblum in the two room. And he got halfway going in and it's, a light bulb just went off in his head. He stopped, he turned around, he went outside the motor pool, got to his truck, opened up his vehicle, and came out with a can of air. And came back to the sergeant and said, here's your can of AIR. And he just like, <laughs> it, was a, it backfired on him because we knew he was going, no, it backfired on him. Toby's team got a call one day that a front-end loader was down with a flat tire. The team responded to the coordinates and began the process of changing it out. As they put on the new tire, the machine shifted. When it did, it flipped. And it pinned me down. I uh, pushed the, the guys that was with me, uh, Tom go, it, it was going and I slipped and I fell. And when it did, it caught me and I broke my back in three different places. I broke the C1 and C2 vertebrae, the T2, T3 vertebrae, and my whole lumbar was totally crushed. They had fused my neck together, fused my back together, and put rods and stuff in my lower back. It was a very painful first five years of my life was very painful of multiple surgery. And Doctors like, you know, don't know if you want to walk again. I like, you know, it's grace of God. I mean, it's, it's him. I'm leaving it in his hand. You know, it was something for me to have this. And for me, I left it, you know, I told him, I said, it's meant for me to, to walk again. It's meant for me to walk again. You did this to, for a reason. I don't know. I don't, and I'm accepting it. I was really shocked. I was, it just seemed surreal that someone would be injured like that and be upright and walking and talking and survive something like that. Then I dealing with all this, I realized I also suffered a severe traumatic brain injury, which caused me to have grandma seizures and it damaged my, my vocal cords and stuff. So I had to learn to really retrain myself from like a child, you know, learn how to walk and crawl and to go to speech therapy, to learn to halfway talk again. My short term memory brain was shot. I could be talking to somebody and then five minutes later, I mean, I walk away and come, okay, who was that person I was talking to, you know? I went, I mean, for the longest time, I, I still do it. I still have sticky notes all over my house. Or I've got a calendar and it has nothing but appointments on what I gotta do. I have people remind me, don't forget, you gotta take your meds. You know, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. And it's very, you know, it's, excuse my French, a pain in the butt because you got people telling you, you, what you gotta do for the rest of your life. You know, in a way you kind of feel helpless, but they're there for you. And I realized that, you know, they, they love me because they're my family and they just want to make sure I want to be there for them. It's very important because family is everything. I love my family. I love spending time with them. And I really honestly wouldn't have it any other way. Oh, it's everything to us. We don't have a lot of outside friends because we spend all of our time with our family. Living with PTSD every day is like a, put your life in a snow, in a, a snow globe and shake it up. Okay, and you see your whole life just floating and then when it falls down, it's never in the same spot. Okay, that's what in a way to me how I, I can kind of like explain what PTSD is. Because another way to aspect is 
watch the most horrible horror movie that you ever seen, picture that, and multiply that by 10 times to 20 times the effect. And then you get a very small glimpse of what we live through every single day, that fear. We are in very high alert 24 seven. You don't know who's coming around the corner. You don't know, you know what's going on. You senses are so in tune that they're, how do you say it, the more heightened than normal. He had to sit in a certain place and it seemed like um, he would be scanning the room and he was listening to me, but he was busy scanning the room the whole time. Because you have to live off your senses and you, there's no way of turning it off like a light switch. It's on 24 seven. So living with PTSD is a nightmare within itself because one day you're normal, the next day you're living in a movie that is a horrible movie that is a repeat over and over and over in your mind. And that's one way how I can pretty much try to explain it to somebody can understand what we are going through every day. I mean, that's just my, you know, just my thoughts, my expressions. You know, other people who has it can like, tell you something different, but that's the best way for me to tell uh, what PTSD is. When the doctor diagnosed me having, a, like, having seizures and I have to, and I was warned to have to have a service dog, I was in a way of First of all, how to get one. And second of all, it's like, do I really need one? And, and well, he's, we're having you know, major seizures and stuff. Uh, yes, because he can, they can sense it more, uh, quicker than you can. And they can get you more help. I was very leery of, it, of getting one, but I'm glad you know that the doctor did recommend me of getting a, a service dog because back then when I got Duke, uh, ADA didn't rec recognize PTSD as a disability. You can have a emotion support animal for PTSD, but you couldn't have a service dog for PTSD. So it wasn't for four or five years after having Duke that ADA finally you know, realized that, you know what, we need to put PTSD as a disability uh, and it was warranted for service dogs. And that's when a lot of organizations uh, stepped up to the plate. I knew I wanted a German Shepherd because I already had a female Shepherd and it belonged to my wife at the time. But I wanted the true sh Shepherd. Found a breed actually the Ashley Brethren, the true European Shepherd. And he was a uh, Vietnam vet. He lived in Georgia, quote in the same town I was living in, and talked to him and found out he actually had his shepherd was pregnant. I like he told me, if you get a male, I want a male shepherd. I said, if not, I'll take a female, but I you know this is gonna be training for my service dog. So when Duke was born. Uh, he was born on March 18th, like three o'clock in the morning. Cause it's like every 30 minutes, I got a phone call, you know, from the owner and say, ah, uh, oh, got a female. You know, another one coming, ah, oh, it's female. Oh, this was, you know, it's a male. Then we're like, yeah, cool, we got a boy. We all know why. So 30 minutes later, I was, my family and I was actually was holding him, you know, when he was 30 minutes old. And every day for 30 minutes, for eight weeks, I got to hold him and got to play with him. So I started having that bond with him. I knew that he was gonna be special. 
you know, I knew that he's, he was smart. I mean, he was, he's going to, you know, he, he's going to be a good fit. So that's how I said I had backed up because when I first met him, it was like he was 30 minutes old. And ever since then, he's been with me. Training with Duke for actually getting Duke, um, he was trained, like I said, he was, he was trained for me. But it, right at the beginning, it wasn't an instant connection. I knew he was there t to help me. I was very picky when we were out and about. One, I wasn't you know, ready for that transition. But to me, in my mind, I wasn't really ready to have a service dog 24-7. But just one day, you know, we were just playing around at the house and then, you know, it's like, he just knew I was just having a day off day and he just came up and just stuck his head on my lap, you know, and just looked at me and he's like, you know, everything's okay. So that's when I knew. Excuse me. That, that bond was there. And it's been there ever since. And uh, he's my lifesaver. He's my my wingman. Uh, without him, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, I hear you, old man. Uh, he don't have to speak. I mean, it just through their actions, you can look at their their facial expressions on their unconditional love for you and the willingness to be there for you no matter what and that's where that bond started it wasn't instant connection it was about a year after having them when it, it connected that he was there for me he wasn't a pet he never meet me out. He never met, you know, greet me at the door when I come home because he was not home. He was beside me 24/7. Wherever I went, he was beside me. The relationship between my dad and Duke it means the world. Everybody needs someone or a pet or anything to kind of like make things a little bit easier. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff I want to go do, but I couldn't do because I had him. I mean, my life changed a lot having him, but it was for the better. I mean, I had a lot of great memories of doing stuff with him, and I'm thankful for it because he has saved my life many times. And he's, he's my best friend. I learned through Duke that you live life daily. Every day is a challenge, but you live your life a fullest every day. Looking through Duke's eyes and through his soul every day, you see that they don't have no care in the world. They don't care what happened yesterday. They don't care what's going on for tomorrow. They live by the moment. And watching him day in and day out for 13, well, almost 14 years now, I just live one day at a time and give 100% or try to do that day. I might have a good day and I might be outside for a couple of hours. I might have a bad day and I might be locked up in my office all day. But he's with me 24-7 and he has that unconditional love for me. And he can tell when I'm having a good day or a bad day. And he just, he's there. And when I'm having a bad day, he'll give me his ball. When he was younger, we'd go play ball. You know, now he's old, he just rolls his ball to, to me. Uh, but it's just the 
unconditional love that we have for each other now. Over the years, Toby and Duke have had many adventures together, from meeting celebrities and being on TV to traveling by land and sea. He got to meet the captain of the ship and all the crew, and the, uh, he got spoiled for the week he was on the, on the ship because the, uh, the head uh, chef came and asked if he could give Duke some scraps of, oh, you know, I don't care, I'm on vacation, you know? He, and where I go, he, he go with me. Yeah, this one, we was, uh, this, this, is a, this is a, this is really cute. I was home back home in Arkansas, and we was in the hot springs, and there's a, a fountain, and it's actually hot water comes through it 24 seven, it's natural hot water. Well, this is right around the holidays, and it got snow on the ground, and we was out walking, uh, look at the lights, well, Duke turned around and seen this look like a swimming pool, and he hopped in, and there was never hot water. Snow on the ground, the dog jumped in, about, uh, about two foot of water. He hopped in and he hopped out because that water was about, uh, about 90 degrees, and he didn't know if it was hot or cold. It was too much too warm for him, and it was comical. He hopped in and he hopped out, and it was like, he kind of like looked like, oh, I try to tell you, it was hot water, dog. You, you, didn't, you know, Duke likes to go swimming. Uh, I remember uh, my, uh, my kids kept on hollering before I, I had my in-ground pool, had a above-ground pool, and my kids kept on hollering, Dad, what? Get Duke out of the pool. He's in here swimming. He jumped in the, in the pool and go swimming with the kids. So got an in-ground pool. And, Turn, turn around, I put an underground fence around it to keep him away from it, yeah, it didn't work. But he loved it so much, it's like I talked to a friend of mine that, uh, with for the American Red Cross and said, you know what, is there a way you, you, we can train a dog to become a, a lot of and swimming pools? And uh, he said, yeah, sure. He said, we can do this and this. So uh, he worked with Duke, you know, and he and Duke got trained to, Become a, uh, a lifeguard for the swimming pools because we had all all, um, all the guys I worked with had little kids and stuff. So when they come over for barbecues and stuff, and they're swimming in the in the, in the pool, uh, yeah, we're watching them. But he was also we were watching them quicker, and he can go in quicker than we can. But it was just but also he liked going in and go swimming with the kids anyway, and the kids loved it. So it was just. Yeah, it was pretty cool. One of the key factors in Toby's recovery was the hyperbaric chamber. He first learned of it when he met a woman named Sarah at a combat veterans event. My name is Sarah Stoltman and I am the owner of Hampton Roads Hyperbaric Therapy and also the co-founder of Heal the Warriors. So we were talking and she said, have you ever tried hyperbaric treatment? I like no, but you know I'm game for you know for any type of other treatment you know, and if it works, I'll let you know other people know because I'd rather be a guinea pig, you know, and have alternative treatment than being dosed with medication. And so she's bringing me to you know the situation. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy consists of breathing 100% oxygen at greater atmospheres. This is done in a hyperbaric chamber that simulates pressures 5 to 50 feet below sea level. The pressure then forces the oxygen to dissolve into the plasma and is carried throughout the body. This helps to reduce inflammation, stimulate stem cell production, and begin the growth of new blood vessels. The pressure actually forces the oxygen to dissolve and saturate every tissue, muscle, bone, and fluid in the body to accelerate healing. So when you have somebody with a traumatic brain injury, there are areas of the brain that are lacking oxygen, and so they're not able to function properly. So they kind of go into a hibernation mode, um, and the hyperbaric oxygen therapy over time helps to put blood flow back in those damaged areas. When I went through the treatment, they done a pre and post testing thing, and mine was way off the chart on, on everything, from memory to you name it. it was. They had a big huge chart and everything else. Since my accident, I, uh, I had severe pain. I am on uh, hydrocodone. 
Uh, they switch me up on different type of painkillers so our, my body will not get used to it. I take seizure medication, uh, memory loss, uh, um, ever since my accident and everything else coming back, you know, through the, the different disability from PTSD to TBI, I lost my marriage, uh, constant pain of for 10 years, for almost 10 years, I've very seldom come out of the house. I have tried to commit suicide in the past, but luckily, you know, uh, it just wasn't there. You know, I thank the good Lord every day. Uh, but other than that, I mean, I have yelled, I had a scream, I had panic attacks. I mean, it's frustrating. It's very, you know, it's, it's. Yeah, it's hard. When I got done, I was almost back to normal. I wasn't all the way in the green, but I was from way, being way off here to the chart to being, you know, really, really close. Hi, I'm Armin Yarborough. I'm a retired sergeant of the United States Army. And I just got to complete a 40 treatment dive here at the Heidelberg Chamber. And the 40 treatment that has been a lot of, I have noticed a lot of improvement. I'm more on being able to concentrate. In the past, I wasn't being able to. I hope that they get more research and everything else and get grants and stuff that they need. Because it's a good, it's a, it's a good program. I'm glad I got, you know, to get into it. But I also noticed that uh, when I was going through it, that it was working because my short-term memory bank was totally gone through my traumatic brain injury. I couldn't remember anything, you know. I couldn't remember talking to somebody five minutes after I talked to them. And at the same time, I was going to school. And prior to going, you know, doing this, I went, I was failing college. And now when I was, I was going back to school, going through this, and I was remembering what my professor was telling me. I was comprehending my assignments and everything else. And it's like, you know what, this is just working. Because my first semester of college, I had a perfect 4.0. My second term, I had a 3.89. You know, it's like, hold on here. In the past, I was failing all these classes, and now I'm making A's and B's. And then I also realized that my seizures were slowly diminishing. So some way it was, was, was working. I noticed a huge difference in his speech. Uh, he was able to have a full-on conversation without stopping and saying um, every other word. Uh, he would lift his arms up because he was frustrated trying to figure out what he was trying to say. I know that he had a lot of seizures before he started and that stopped uh, for a good two years um, after the treatment. He, his personality came out, he was always joking around and his wife was very happy and you could just kind of see that the old Toby was back. So going through the 40 dives and stuff, after it, i not normal and I would never be normal but it had helped me enough that I finished a college degree, not, not only an associate, but a BS degree, and I graduated my BS with a 4.0 GPA. On top of, I gained 20% of my short-term memory bank when it was totally gone. On top of this, I literally seen uh, other veterans going through this, and it really had helped them with the PTSD. I have seen actually help with people that uh, has dementia, has uh, high blood pressure. I seen a little girl that first five years of her life wasn't speaking. And after her fifth dive, she turned around and spoke to her mom and told her mom that she loved her. Five years of not talking. And then uh, after the fifth dive, she was, was talking to her mom and went from a wheelchair to a walker. So something's going on. Our body is killing our own self and it's an alternative 
of having our self heal than being doped up with all these medications. Because when, right prior to all this, I was taking nine to 12 different types of medication daily. And now I'm just at the point of my basic stuff, I have to pretty much survive. So if you can start out with the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, your headaches are going to go away. You're going to get the sleep that you should be getting, eight to 10 hours a night, and you're going to be able to think of what you're trying to say, your cognition's going to improve, and all of that will allow you to function better every day in life. It'll allow you to do better in physical therapy, speech therapy, your job, go back to school, um, have a better relationship with your family. It just kind of allows you to do everything else better. <laughs> My seizures, I'm having grandma seizures uh, four or five times a week. I down to maybe have maybe once uh, every three months going through this on top of having short-term memory gone and slowly went from zero, a part of your brain that's totally destroyed. On top of the, my, the I have what they call a clear malformation, which is mean I got a hole in the back of my brain and it's leaking fluid. It actually healed up with a bone, with the axle bone shoved up in my brain which caused me to have my seizures. My brain is totally scrambled. So it actually made a blood clot around a bone that shoved up my brain that they can't take out because I do, they'll, they'll kill me. So they left it in there. Stuff's happening, you know, the body is healing itself. And I see it. And you know what, if I, if I can shout it out to the whole world, you know, try it, you know. It might work for you. I mean, it ain't, you, you're not taking any drugs. All this is you are just breathing pure oxygen in a weightless, weightless atmosphere. I don't think that I could ever explain it in words how rewarding it is to see people get their lives back. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but it just makes me keep fighting to make this available to hurt people. Nothing that lives lasts forever, no matter how much we love it, no matter how much we want to keep it around. Duke is no exception to that rule. Toby's first glimpse at the passage of time in his aging friend happened on a regular Saturday morning. When I vacationed two years ago, uh, and it was normal, we went out in the town. I mean, it was on a Saturday morning and we went out in town. I uh, just got out of the vehicle, walked maybe a block, and he, he, he went down and he was hollering. I mean, like he was hurting, like somebody shot him. I mean, he was that much pain. Uh, I turned around, you know, Carol and I, you know, turned around and it's like, okay. Uh, he, he wasn't moving, period. He was down, he was literally down. And at that point, it's like, okay, something's wrong. She helped me get him back in the vehicle. Uh, and I said, I'll be back. I'm gonna take him back to, to the condo. And at the time, I said, I'm gonna, I said, I'm gonna call the vet and see what I can do. And I'll be back shortly. You can take care of the grandkids and go have some fun and I'll get back with you later. Toby quickly called the vet and asked what he could do to help Duke. Unfortunately, he was in North Carolina, eight hours away from his home. So what can I do to help ease his pain, whatever? So they told me what to do, uh, because I was explaining the situation. And he did the rest of the week. We, I left him at the unit, and we did some stuff here and there, but we didn't. Uh, that week, we went out for maybe for a couple hours and we came back because I knew he was there and I knew, you know, uh, he needed my help and everything else. Or Carol took the grandkids out and I stayed back in the unit with him for the rest of the week. And it was just, it was heartbreaking 
It just it really was. Got back to the got back on vacation, got me in, and they x-rayed him. And it showed that his right hip, he does not have hip dysplasia, he never had that. It's just that he was a old dog, okay? He had severe arthritis in his joint, in his hip joint, of the, and also his whole spine from his neck to his tailbone is all deteriorated. So uh, the vet turned around and said, uh, you need to retire him. And I couldn't do that. I know I had to. I knew it was going to be hard. Uh, at that stage, I cried because I didn't know how long he had because having his spine already deter deteriorated, so I know what he's going through in a way. So, only thing we do is, he, they say he was healthy and everything else, he just had put him on pain meds to help ease the pain for him, and had to ease up on his activities, and I'm still active. So my life totally changed 180 degrees. I have a very sick puppy that's the love of my life. That has saved my life so many times, 13 years. Well, maybe say 14 because he'd be 14 in, in March. And that was my turn to take care of him. But at that time, it take care of him I had to find someone to take care of me. I had to find a replacement for him. So that's how I feel. I mean, I'm losing my best friend. I don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, I mean, that was two years, about almost two years ago when, this, when he went down. He's still doing okay, but I don't know. I mean, I live day by day with him, and I just pray that he live, you know, another, you know, couple more years. With Duke now in so much pain, it was time for Toby to start the search for another service dog. When I found out that I had to retire Duke out, I got in contact with uh, a lot of rescue organizations and to see what, you know, rescue dogs, what kind of dogs they had. I was at the ASCPA looking at dogs, and I seen this pit bull mix, and had a meet and greet to, for this one. And on that same day, I walked by her cage, and I walked by and just, I don't know, just something just, we just connected. I went back and I said, you know what, I told the, you know, the people that had to volunteer for the at the ASCPA. There's another dog from here I wanna look at. They said which one and I went back, got the case them. Said, Oh no, you don't want her. I said, Why not? Well, uh she pretty much been in and out of the case for eighteen months. She's not potty trained. She don't know how to do anything. I said, well, let me be the judge of that. Just bring her out. And they brought her out and it, we just connected. Not only is she bonded with me, but she bonded with Duke right there in the spot. It's like, this is my home, this is my family. So like I said, she was, you know, I walked by, you know, and it was just by fate. And I brought her home and she's been with me ever since. The first two weeks of her, of having her, uh, was crazy. She tore my carpet because she had to be crated because I had to get her to see the vet to make sure our shots are up. Had to get her in the training program to uh, get trained as a service dog. If she was able to become a service dog, she had to be assist. Uh, I had a trainer come out and look at her and see 
she was trainable. It was just by faith. I mean, that I walked by that day to see her, and she'd been with me ever since. Once Sasha became part of the family, it was time for her training to begin. The difference between Sasha and Duke, they are like night and day. Duke is laid back and chilled. Uh, his training is uh, with had trainers, so once I got him, he had to go to training, and then once he got to a certain phase, then I was wrong in. At the beginning, Duke had to do what they call the canine good, good citizenship training, and it's a basic part of making sure that the that he he set he he uh, lays down, he stays, he comes to you when you're on command. He he's, he's right on cue on command when he's out in public. He's not aggressive towards anybody. Dick was training for my seizures. I had literally be off my my medications. I was monitored by a doctor and with a trainer. So when I was off my medication, then Duke can sense when I'm back to have it. And the trainers were training Duke on what to do uh, when I was having seizures. So he was smelling my pheromones way before I was about to have it, and he would go get his backpack. And so it was easy assets for him. He'll go get it, he'll bring it to me, and that tells me, okay, I got to take my, med my medication. Only time he ever jump up on me is when I got laid down, because I'm about to have a grandma seizure and then he'll lay down right beside me and make sure I'm safe and go and, and go through the process. With Shasha, uh, she was with me when I got her and she, I had a trainer that kind of helped me train her. Steven, uh, he was really good from Tashaw. He was really good. He'd been a Air Force vet that dog, he was a dog handler for the Air Force and he volunteers for Tadishaw. My name is Stephen Friedman. I train dogs for the Air Force. And in addition to that, prior to the Air Force, I've been training dogs since I've been 16. Being with Tadishaw is unique. I, I have PTSD. And I, know that, I knew that with PTSD, I was able to get a dog and have it trained, but I had no idea where. So what I did was I called around and I found TADSAW. It's T-A-D-S-A-W, that means Train the Dog, Save a Warrior program. So he knew how it's, you know, he, he seen the potential in her. He, he seen the potential that I had because I already had a service dog. So the training for Shasha was totally different because I already had started working with her. Uh, because I had her tether with Duke, because I knew what the regulations, ADA regulations was. Because having one for 14 years, you know the laws in and out by ADA. And training her the same way that Duke been trained. We work with him to do everything that any other dog would do. And finally, within just a few weeks, he graduated because he really wanted to make his dog, and he worked hard, make his dog a service dog. And you know Toby now, you know what this dog is capable of, and you've seen it. Uh, I'm proud of Toby, and I'm proud of Sasha too, but mainly Toby because he did the work. Sasha just followed him. They set the door uh, at the vehicle, and they won't move till you turn around and tell them to get in the vehicle. When you're at a restaurant, they go up on a table and they lay down. They don't beg for food or anything else. Uh, they just monitor you because that's what they're trained to do. What we do is we train heal, stay, down, sit, uh, take a break, which means that they don't have to listen to commands and they can go out and do what they want to do. And we do it so the dog enjoys this. He's really good. I mean, we... Um... I just want to be the best that I can, the best trainer that I can for Bo. This dog saved my quality of life. 
He's going to, I know he's going to be with me until the day that he dies or I die. Uh, so I work, started working with her, but Tad saw sharpen my skills and sharpen her skills to become the best service dog to replace Duke, and she has. I wouldn't have another dog to replace Duke other than Sasha. She is in tune with me for a dog that's been with me for just over a year. She is so in tune with me as Duke is uh, for 14 years. So it's a blessing and I thank God for that because he knew that she needed a home and I needed another dog. He advised me that he had a new service dog that he was trying to attempt to make a service dog and then he had one that was just too old to work anymore. And I offered him free training, completely free. And we became friends after that. And the program was really good. Uh, all the people he interacted with and the trainers that helped him out with her, they were, they were wonderful. There was a lot of difference on financial on training. Uh, when I got Duke in 2003, 2004, uh, it cost me $40,000 to have him train out of my pocket. Back then, there was no or, uh, nonprofit organization like Battle Buddies, K9 for Warriors, Dog Tags, or a few, and the Tag Shaw, uh, and uh, Wax for Warriors, uh, who stepped up the plate and started a nonprofit organization to train dogs, become service dogs for veterans and it's free for vets. So there's a lot of stuff came in 14 years. 14 years ago, 40 grand out of my pocket to have Duke train to become my Caesar Alert dog and my PTS dog. Now, uh, with Shasha, Shasha was, 30, was free for me. Uh, other than, you know, what I had to do to get her out of the dog pound and get her all the shots and stuff. So I hired a box out of my pocket compared to $40,000 out of my pocket. Uh, the advancement with these nonprofits, the diff, uh, in, in the, since Duke been trained, been a blessing. Uh, as I said, because it don't cost a vet anything. And I know some organizations, if you're a vet you're, or a family of a vet, this means that you're a son, your daughter of a veteran they need a service dog a lot of time. They're like, okay, you know, you're part of the family. You, you know, you, you want to get one. A lot of the organizations are tra that are training these dogs, they are veterans. So they, it's one close knit family. You're a vet. Doesn't matter what branch of the military you came from, they see that you need a companionship to live a normal life. Despite the troubles in his life, Toby still has joy in his heart because of his dogs. Not just because of their service to him, but because of the fun inherent in them. Take both of them for walks. I mean, he, Duke leads the way. I mean, and I let both of them just run. Just let it run free, you know, and Duke just, he does his those slow low. They'll walk and Shasha, she, she just runs up, you know, and if I, she gets over too far, I holler and she'll come back to me and say, okay, I'm back. And she takes back off, you know, run, just like a normal dog. I mean, she's she having fun and Duke's having fun because he's with me and he's getting extra, his exercise and he's happy. Also, I mean, this time I'll take both of them to Walmart in case he wants to go. I mean, if he's in a good mood, he feels like he wants to do stuff, I take both of them, but both of them got, gets up and go work with me. Uh, people at the at my office that I work with, they got the run of the they got the run of the of the building. They go and you know and say hi to everybody and lays down by somebody like you know. Oh, okay, I'm gonna go in so and so's office and chill, and they go in there and they lay down and they chill. But you know they, they always keep an eye on me because. Our offices are so close together and our doors are open. Everybody loves the dogs and it's a really great atmosphere because 
they just walk out. And, oh, hi, Sasha. You know, hi, Dick. How you doing? And they'll pet and they give them a treat. And you know, they just, they're happy. Having been a part of many efforts to help the lives of veterans, Toby, naturally, has strong feelings on mental health, how it's perceived in our culture, and the mistakes people make with veterans and service animals. Our mental health uh, is treated very poorly. I have witnessed that firsthand for 15 plus years. Our VA system is really uh, bad off. We have waiting periods for veterans that go in to, for a simple testing to go in to actually go see a psychiatrist or psychologist or even get a x-ray done. You know, they are waiting, you know, up to six months just to get in. They want to throw more drugs on us than of looking the uh, other alternative to help us, and that is getting us service dogs, also using other uh, you know, medical alternatives like the hyperbaric treatment. I was going to turn around and say how, I mean, and the VA sucks. And I'm going to say that very bluntly. And, and I can tell you as an example that I was, was real close to the VA hospital. My son took me there, went to the emergency room because I was passing kidney stones and I was picking in my own arm. I was low crawling and laying in my own puke. And the medical staff at the ER was walking over me and stuff like I was a piece of freaking statue or furniture and didn't want to help me. And he was, I'm in a lot of pain. I'm at the VA hospital. Can you come up here? Uh, so I said, okay. So, hour and a half, almost two hours later, I arrived up there and looked everywhere for him and found his son, Trey. And I got back into the room and he was curled up in a ball and I'm looking at him and I'm like, have they seen you yet? He's like, no, they just put me in here. I said, no IV, no, no pain meds, no. And he's just, and he was in horrific pain, it was horrible. And my son got really pissed off and blew his top and he was chewing everybody butts out. And he said, you know what, my dad's in here, laying in his dying on puke, dying, and you guys don't give a crap, and you want to give somebody a freaking darn band-aid. I thought, well, gosh, you know, I mean, who runs a place like that? That's how sorry our VA system is. And I have never stepped one back in during VA system again. It was really traumatizing, and I was like, I'm glad I don't have to come here. Lucky enough, I am retired. I am medically retired on top of that, so I can go to a regular military installation that I can use their uh, facilities. And I have gone through that because I got better care than the VA system. And I feel sorry for the people that have to go to the VA, and that's the only spot they have, because I have been there many, many, many times, and it sucks. Our VA needs to be totally revamped, fire everybody up in front, and start brand new. And maybe we might fix this and get our veterans the help that they need. With the impact of Duke and Sasha on Toby during his lifetime, he strives to help legitimize the need for service animals in the lives of others suffering with PTSD. He's also very vocal against what he describes as fake service animals. His passion has led him to work with other veterans towards this goal. I have actually f talked in front of the Senate committee uh, to act with other veterans, not only myself, but a group of other veterans, along with other senators, to pass a bill that every service dog will be microchip and every service dog will be in a special database that will show that the dog is trained by web organization because they will have their, their ID from that organization. Like uh, Shasha is trained through Tashaw. Duke is trained through the International Guide Dog Association. Uh, so with that, then uh, 
to the database there, it shows that they are trained by a organization that actually trains service dogs. So when uh, somebody have a law enforcement officer or a paramedic, whatever, are afraid to come in and yeah, it's a service dog where his ID, they can pull it out, it's like a driver's license. Uh, they can scan it, okay, and it will show that yes, this this dog is a service dog, this is his name, this is the owner, this is what he's trained for, and everything else. And it's slowly going through that route because there are going to be times that we're in the hospital and the dogs are with us, but you're going to need another handler to handle that dog while they're taking care of the owner. And so that's a lot of stuff that are in the process of actually being done now because there are a lot of people are bringing, getting a vest and a fake ID off the internet and saying that their dog is a service dog and which is not a, a pet. And this is my pet, my very pet peeve is that, guess what? If you are doing this, one, you're breaking the law, and two, you are liable for your dog. So you ain't thinking, you know, uh, outside the box, or well, what happened my dog, you know, bite somebody. We have to deal with our dogs 24 seven a day. We gotta make sure that dog is not aggressive. Even though you think your dog is not aggressive, your dog could be aggressive towards another dog or towards somebody else when he's out in public. These dogs are trained to make sure they're not aggressive, not a threat to other people out in public and everything else. So that is like I said, that's my, that's why I'm a big advocate and I do a lot of public speaking and helping senators in Congress, you know, to pass these laws, uh, laws for people that pretty much saying their dogs are service dogs and they're not. And that's what, you know, hurts us that actually have service dogs. After hearing of all the struggles and troubles that someone with PTSD goes through, it seems overwhelming to the people who want to help those affected. Luckily, Toby always has advice for those who want to help. There are a lot of classes are out there that will give you the basics of what we go through. Okay. You would never will understand what we go through in our daily lives. Nobody would, can unless you are suffering with PTSD. And every one of us suffer in a totally different way. We suffer in, in a way that is the same but different. It's that fight, fight or flight mode. Like to somebody else, it might not be a big deal. Like whatever situation it is, whether you're dealing with people or just something triggering it, but in your, in your mind, you're going to die. Like your, your mind can't tell the difference between this is nothing and this is like life threatening. So I freak out. Well, that's what it looks like to other people is I'm just freaking out about nothing. But to me, it's life or death inside my head. Understanding is the first step of helping somebody to recover. We lose over 22 people a day to suicides, veterans. Our job and my desire is to try to save as many as I can. Um, my dog taught me about life. They taught me to live one day at a time because they live in the moment. And with somebody with PTSD, if you live in the moment, you can enjoy life better than drilling on the past. It took me a long time to realize that if you live in the moment, like my babies do, uh, then you're happy, because they're happy. You, have, you, have you ever noticed when a child loses its parent and it's over in the corner and it's sad, you see a dog curled up to him. It's just, it's right there. And just having, you know, there just, that child, you know, emotion has changed. You know, from, yeah, the child is still sad, but 
is also it has a little comfort. And that's what these animals do. They give us comfort. They give us something to live for every day. I wake every day. I wake up every day now, and they give me life. They give me something to show every day, and it's something different every day. This stuff, silly stuff that Shasha does, or something that Duke does, I'll laugh. You know, or there were the little quirks of when I started playing with Shasha, because Shasha want, you know, knows I'm down, you know, and she wants to see me play. And I was saying, Duke, he's coming over with his ball, you know, and both of them are fighting over, fighting me to get my attention to, to both of them. You live in the moment. And when you live in the moment, you're happy. And when you're happy, you can't think about the past. And when you can't think about the past, your PTSD is not there. And it took me 14 years to realize that. But my baby sweater taught me life and how to live it. The amount of help, joy, and encouragement that Duke and Sasha have given Toby can never be fully expressed. It would take a lifetime, perhaps longer. But even still, there's another force at work in Toby's life that has given him strength beyond the lives of his friends, his family, and his dogs. I was raised up a Christian. My uncle, preacher. Uh, so I already had faith. I guess it was me giving faith through other people, especially the doctors, because my mom you know, was in the medical profession, that there are other stuff out there that can help us. But when I had my accident and when I woke up and I was on a flight going from Ubikistan to Germany, and I realized I was alive. You know, I put my totally faith in God 100%, but without faith, there's no hope. And with this no hope, there's no future. So for me to tell other veterans, what I have been in your shoes. I know what you're going through. Have faith. And there are people who are out there that are in your shoes. You're not alone. If you need somebody, call. Call an old friend of yours. Call family members. Call somebody. There are numbers that you can call that they were there and they're listening to you. And they feel you need help, you can get help, you know. I, a long time ago, I was in the issue of committing suicide, and I admit that, you know, many times. But faith in God, there was something about, he did this for a purpose, he did this for a reason. And now I know why he did this, because now I can, can tell my story. It took me 14 years of having faith in God and hope that I went from a wheelchair to I'm walking. I won't be able to run. I won't be able to do a lot of other stuff, but I'm walking. I have faith in God. I have hope that I am living day to day. I'm enjoying life with my families. I'm enjoying life with my, my fur babies. God has a purpose. And that purpose to me went 14 years ago. I can see it now telling my story to let other people know that you have a purpose in life. You might not know what it is now, but don't give up hope. Don't give up that faith. God has a plan for you. You titled your book, The Quiet Healing. So obviously, your dogs can't talk like humans can. However, how have Duke and Sasha healed you without saying a word to you? Their emotion. You have been with me for the last three days. 
you see their emotion towards me. You, you see how, come here. You see how happy, you know, they don't have to say a word, but it's their expression. They live in the moment. They are happy all the time. They know when you're sad. They, when you're sad, they're there. And I was saying your sadness turned back into happiness. I named this book The Quiet Healing is because they do heal us very quietly in their own way. One day at a time in their own natural way. They do silly stuff and you laugh at them. They turn around, they come up, they put their, their head on your lap and they'll look at you. You know, and you can look right in their soul. And it's like, you know what? Yeah, I am having a bad day, you know? Pet me. And you pet them. They just, whether it's snuggling up with him or playing or just like pet me, pet me, you know? You know, they're very, they're very persistent. And you get that, that, that feeling of the love that the, the dog is there. The dog loves you unconditionally. We're here, but they're right there. They never leave his side. You know, they're there for him and with him in ways that we can never be. And in 14 years, Duke has their openings with us. Sorry. Without saying a word, he has been beside me for 14 years. My bad days, my good days. He loved me unconditionally. When I'm sick, he's there. When I'm sad, he's there. When I'm happy, he's there. They have this sixth sense that just makes it, they know what's going on and they can just kind of sit there. And if he's in a meltdown or anything like that, they'll just be there. Without saying a word, I can look at his face and I can see his smile on his face. I can see his sadness. I can see the pain that he's going through <laughs> right now. <laughs> Without saying a word. The bond of having an animal in your life is very emotional. And yes, I am very emotional. Because if it wasn't for Duke, and now with Shasha in my life, I would not be here. I would have been a total alcoholic, or I have committed suicide by now, or I'd be in jail. But God put them in my life for a reason. And with that reason is to heal me slowly through my pain and my suffering of having PTSD, having a traumatic brain injury, having seizures, uh, going through life experience in 14 years, and now telling a story of how two wonderful dogs not only have saved my life, but have touched the lives of other people that have been around them I don't care for an hour or five minutes or five years. There are times when Duke was younger, I walk up and I even do it with Shasha. A little child turn around, you know, they look and they say, no, no, you can't touch that dog because you know, it's, uh, it's a service dog and stuff. But I see that child, you know, and I ask the parent, you know what, this, do you child want to pat, you know, do, you know, they said, well, yeah. And I asked, we well, want to pat them? And they kind of like, you see the, the, the joy in their face. And I turn around and I put, you know, Duke in a lay down position so the child don't feel a threat because he's a big dog. And they say, you know, I have a five-year-old just playing all over my dog in the middle of Walmart. And people are looking at me, well, you got a dog, you know, it's pet. You know what? You never know. That child right there 
might have some type of disability, might have autism, might have Down syndrome, might have something. You don't know what that child is going through. But you know what? You turn around, you look at that child's face now. That child got a big, huge, happy smile on that face because the dog, because that dog was there and changed that child's life. That dog does the same thing for me. Shasha does the same thing for me. I think that Toby's dogs have completely changed his life for the good. I have never seen anybody bonded with their animal as much as Toby and Duke. Um, I remember when he told me that he didn't know what he would do with his life if, if he lost Duke and he's been with Toby every step of the way and Toby is now there for him every step of the way and I just think it's incredible. I am at a point in my life that I'm healed enough that I'm not afraid to go outside and see the world and experience the world. I'm not afraid of doing stuff that I was when I came back from a war zone and been locked up in my house. I've been there. Now I'm at a point I can do some stuff that I couldn't do 14 years ago because of my babies. So why I call it quiet healing is because the unconditional emotions that they give out to heal us.